All right, um, welcome uh, to the seventh annual MIT Festival of Learning. It is great to see so many uh, familiar and new faces here uh, this morning. Um, I'm Chris Capazzola, MIT Senior Associate Dean for Open Learning and a professor of history. And together with my co-convener, uh, Vice Chancellor Ian Waits, um, who will join us later this morning, we are really excited uh, to host today's event. Um, the, the two offices coordinate this event each year to bring MIT instructors, students, and staff together to talk about innovation in teaching and learning at MIT and beyond. Uh, let me begin first with a couple of words of thanks, um, in particular to those uh, people who played a, an, an important role in organizing this event, um, to Joby Nazareno, Aaron Kessler, and Cheryl Barnes from MIT Open Learning. So thank you for all of your work with us. Just a brief word of housekeeping. Uh, today's session is being recorded. Um, if you don't wish to be part of the recording, um, the seats toward the back of the auditorium will not be on camera, so just move around um, as you wish. Second, also, please, please, please um, make sure to sign up on the form that is coming around if you do not already receive uh, regular emails from Open Learning. Um, this is, this is a, an old-fashioned technology called a clipboard. Um, uh, it is a really crucial tool for um, staying in touch with people um, and making sure uh, that we can continue the conversation um, going forward. We promise not uh, to contact you too often. Um, this will be a really just a great opportunity to learn about things that other people at MIT are doing. Now, just to give you a feel for things, um, MIT Open Learning uh, is dedicated to a mission of transforming teaching and learning at MIT and around the globe through the innovative use of digital technologies. And our partner, the Office of the Vice Chancellor, aims to advance academic innovation and foster the growth of every MIT student, empowering them to make a positive impact at MIT and beyond. Now, as you can imagine, with two missions like that, and given that it is 2024, we knew that this year's festival needed to address the ways that generative AI is changing teaching and learning here at MIT and beyond. <clears throat> but it's also not fall 2022 anymore. Uh, and now that we are firmly into what we might call hype cycle year two, we knew that if we put together a festival of learning uh, with a keynote address reminding us that generative AI has some opportunities and some challenges and that you all would yawn terribly and this would not be a success, right? So we promise no keynotes, right? Um, and what we have instead um, is people who are doing, right? And we've learned from many of you that what you're most curious about is to hear what are people at MIT doing? What are they building? What are they making? What are they testing? And what are they finding from classrooms on our campus right now? Um, and so that's what we have for you today, an exciting round of panels, reflections, and explanations. We'll hear first from faculty and instructors across MIT schools who are building learning-related generative AI tools, using them in class, adapting their teaching approaches um, from everything from assessment to probability to how to ask an intelligent question, um, and thinking critically about new technologies. We'll also hear then from students and alumni who are leveraging new tools to advance their own learning goals, who are responding to a changing landscape of school and work, and who are eager for a forum to reflect with each other on their academic and professional responsibilities with this new technology. And over lunch, you'll have a chance to engage with staff of uh, Open Learning's Digital Learning and Residential Education team, who can share with you information about all kinds of technology uh, and approaches to the MIT classroom, everything from Canvas to our Lightboard studios, to MIT's uh, new site license for Microsoft Copilot, um, a generative AI tool. So, um, with no, uh, with you know, uh, without any further ado, um, I'd like to welcome our first panelists to the stage, and I will introduce them briefly um, and turn things over to them. So, while they are getting set up. All right, so I'm uh, thrilled to kick off our first panel on supporting learners through technology and course iteration um, and introduce our four panelists. Um, first, uh, from, uh, uh, from left to right, um, Anna Bell, Senior Lecturer in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and MIT Digital Learning Scientist. Then Melissa Webster, Lecturer in Managerial Communication at MIT Sloan. Jesse Thaler, uh, Professor of Physics and Director of the NSF Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. 
and Takako Aikawa, Senior Lecturer in Japanese in Global Languages uh, here at MIT. What I'm going to do now, I've asked them uh, to each talk for about five to seven minutes um, in turn about sort of th uh, a few different questions that we uh, all sort of iterated on over the last month or so about how generative AI is being used in their classrooms, how they've changed their teaching, promising experiences that they've encountered so far, um, and what their, you know, what their students are telling them about this whole experience. So with that, I'm going to turn things over first to Anna. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So I'm uh, Annabelle, uh, so I'm a lecturer in ECS, and I teach the, basically the intro series uh, in computer science in ECS, so 6100 is the number. There are three flavors of that course. So the first is 6100A, which is half semester, it's just intro to programming and computer science. 6100L is, uh, is 6100A, but for the, for the full semester, so it's geared towards students who have no programming experience. And 6100B is the follow-on course to 6100A. So once they've learned basics of computer science and programming, they then go ahead and take a look at um, what are some applications of programming uh, to um, simulations, optimization problems, and a little bit of machine learning. So though that's a very introductory, um, uh, introduction uh, for students to computer science. So um, the way our courses, courses are structured, I think we're pretty well set up to kind of coexist with Gen AI. Uh, we have a variety of assessments that students do at home and in the classroom. So we, uh, we have students um, submit, uh, do, they do at home problem sets every week. They do um, little exercises to make sure they're staying on track with the material lecture by lecture. This is also done at home. And then in the classroom, we have them come in and do quizzes. So generally, we don't care if they use Gen AI at home on the problem sets because they, uh, the problem sets are large enough that Gen AI won't really help them that much. They're large and broad enough that they can just you know, paste that prompt in and they don't really get the full answer out of uh, the Gen AI, so they do have to do a lot more work on their own to get that, um, to get that uh, problem set done. What we did care about and what we did have trouble with is students uh, using Gen AI in the classroom on quizzes, which is unfortunate, so just kind of violating our quiz policies. It's a large class, so we have about 500 students in uh, 26100, and we don't have enough proctors to have eyes on everyone. And so inevitably, because of our relaxed policies, we were allowing students to have um, the quiz website, so they submit the quiz on, they, they type up code and they submit the quiz on, on the computer, but we did allow them to do their work where they actually um, write code, debug code, test code, kind of iterate on their final solution, uh, on their local, on their computer in whatever environment they found to be uh, comfortable for them. So once they did that, they would just come back to the course website and paste it in there. So that's kind of the, the, the switch between the course website and their local programming environment is kind of where we, uh, we couldn't keep, you know, keep track of everyone's local programming environment. So, so if someone had ChatGPT up, we wouldn't know the difference between that and uh, just a local programming environment. So it was really hard to keep track of students uh, you know, who violated that policy. In the end, we did kind of find them just by looking through the website logs, um, which we kept track of, and we would see this looks, you know, the, the, the comments were still in there uh, in chat GPT format. Uh, the timestamps from when students first looked at the problem to when they first submitted was like, 30 seconds, you know, just enough to copy and paste, you know. Uh, so it was just like these kind of questionable behaviors were like, mm, this doesn't look like it's your work. So um, we've made kind of small tweaks to kind of uh, uh, counteract that behavior uh, to the quizzes by unfortunately not allowing, just not allowing students to switch out to a, 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 a nicer programming environment. So we just ask, ask them to do all their work on the web page. They can still see some test cases, they can still do their work, but it's just not kind of their comfortable uh, programming environment. Um, so that's one, uh, one, uh, one uh, thing that we've done with Gen AI. Another one is, uh, so that's for 6100 A and B, the, the little half semester classes. 
uh, for 6100L, we've done a more major change. So I've actually uh, moved that class from traditional lecture to blended uh, plus active learning uh, this past semester. And I did that kind of with the intent of introducing Gen AI a little bit more during lecture, uh, during in-class sessions. So blended plus active learning, as you know, is uh, I have the students um, watch pre-recorded videos of the lecture content um, before class time. And then during the class time, we have a discussion on the more, uh, har the harder topics from the video. Um, I present them with some um, <clears throat> coding, uh, coding problems that we then do together, and then we discuss together. I have some students come up and co live code for all, everyone else. So it's kind of just like a little good time that we all have together. They have prizes for coming up and, uh, and, and co live coding, because it's, you know, it's hard to do that. Um, so for that class, it's an intro CS class. So there's no way that I will uh, have students kind of use Gen AI right off the bat to solve problems for them because they need to and get the intuition for the concepts. So for that class, I actually reserved <clears throat> one of the latter lectures towards the end of the semester after they've gained an intuition for the concepts, just purely on Gen AI. Um, and what are the pitfalls? What are the uh, best practices of using Gen AI? And for that lecture, actually, what we've done is I start them off with three, um, three pro pro uh, programming questions that we feed into ChatGPT. And these are programming questions that they have already written in the semester. So they've already done this. They're very simple programming questions. They already know how to do these in five minutes or less. But what they notice is that the first pass when we prompt the Gen AI is it gives you incorrect code. They immediately know that it's incorrect just by kind of looking at the code that they get back. One of the problems I think looks correct, so then we write some test cases together and we see, oh, actually it's not correct for some of these other test cases. So they get the intuition that, hey, you have to be critical of the code that you get back. You can't just trust what it does. And um, one of the other ones is just like a really basic math problem that Gen AI gets wrong. So students now also understand that Gen AI is maybe good at doing more creative things, text-based, but it's really bad at math. Math is very hard for Gen AI, right? Because it's probabilistic. So, um, so they have this intuition of, you know, you have to give the, the Gen AI a lot of context for the problem that you want to solve, which is, uh, you know, maybe more trouble than it's worth. Uh, you have to be critical of the results that you get back, um, which is, I think, the, the number one thing that we want our students to take away from this. Uh, and otherwise, um, for the intro CS class, I just introduce Gen AI uh, to students on a need to know basis, pretty much. So if a student comes to my office hours and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this concept, how can I get extra help? I say, you can use Gen AI, you know, open up ChatGPT or Copilot and ask it for extra practice with loops or extra practice with lists. I, you know, I can come up with that for you, but you can also just do it on your own. Um, and you can get, you know, instant, uh, Instant, uh, instant practice or instant different explanations that what I, what I could come up with or what we've come up with in class. Um, if you didn't, you know, if, if the way I explained it didn't really click with you. So that kind of need to know basis is just for students who maybe need that extra help, um, which I think is, is, is also important. That's, that's basically my experience. All right, awesome, so thank you. And so we're just gonna kind of go through each of our four speakers and then eventually we'll have Q&A, so, so save up your questions for then. Melissa, tell us what you've been seeing in Sloan. Great, so we have course iteration in the title of this session and iteration has been something I've been thinking about a lot and really trying to do. And uh, to give you the, the punchline up front, the things I think about for iteration in your course is the the mindset change for adapting to generative AI or integrating generative AI, it's not going to happen in one sort of step. It is really, you need to learn. Um, we're still in very early stages of this. Uh, another is that to try to do at least one experiment per semester or season. And uh, third, to get some student input in the design phase. And fourth, uh, uh, finally, to build in feedback so I'll tell you a few things I've done. I teach uh, at Sloan, I teach management communication for undergraduates, and I teach communicating with data for undergraduates. And a year ago, I 
saw enough of ChatGPT to realize this has a huge impact on um, the, the sort of assignments that students do in these classes, uh, writing, presenting uh, for business audiences. ChatGPT uh, with a decent uh, prompting does really good job for a business audience. And so in the, in the spring, I included uh, an assignment where students generated a cover letter and then they had to critique all of the cover letters in the class as a, a subsequent writing assignment, brought in guest speakers to talk about that. In the summer, I had five Europe students, um, went big, <laughs> um, and uh, just sort of sent them out exploring uh, and coming back every week to tell us what they found. Uh, and also exploring particularly uh, how companies are implementing. And uh, we also looked at uh, on the uh, teaching and learning side, uh, they, a, they could uh, choose a sort of a secondary project of their own interest. And uh, two of the students were interested in the topic of um, AI detection, which I said, you know, I don't really think there's much to this topic because it seems moot. Um, but uh, they said, no, no, we want to know what to do if we're accused of plagiarism. We actually want to have a defense by understanding how this works. So, um, so yes, that was a great exploration in the fall with communicating with data. I teach one section of it. Uh, another colleague teaches another one, and then we have more in the spring. And so uh, the, the easy uh, iteration I could do in the fall was to require it on all assignments. Why did I choose to require it? So my assumption with the material, the courses that I teach, is that students in the workplace will need to be competent with Gen AI for these things in order to be competitive in the workplace. So they need to know how to use these, right? And then my second assumption is that there is a future state where we will have figured out how to do this. We will have figured out how to teach communication skills, writing, presenting, et cetera, in an era of Gen AI. So I'm figuring when the calculators first came out, people were like, ah, how are we gonna do this? This is, you know, this ruins everything. But we figured it out. And so if there's a future state where it is figured out, then I need to be making the steps to get there. I don't want to be waiting for it to somehow get figured out. I want to be making those steps, hence the iteration. And even if it's not the full-blown sort of this is perfect, it is the, the a good version now that allows the students to learn towards that objective and it allows me to learn how, you know, how, how do we get to that future state? And why did I make it required? So one, it goes towards the learning objective of the students knowing how to use it. Uh, if I make it required, then I can say you have to submit my survey of how you used it on this assignment. Now I know people who've made it optional and said you have to tell us how you're using it. And I had that in the spring and I am doubtful that I had 100% compliance. So students were concerned that they might be judged adversely in the grading if they opted to use it. And uh, secondly, it's an extra step for them to do. So they could just say, no, no, I didn't use it. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm able to get that data. So during the semester, I can say, oh, you know, this prompting technique that you use, this is where you went off course on it, or I learned new stuff, um, also good. And it turns out that now I have a whole bunch of data about how students um, use, uh, use Gen AI for this type of work and what they think works well, what doesn't work well, et cetera. So that's been a real uh, plus having that kind of data. And in addition to the surveys, we debriefed, we intermittently during the fall would talk about it and then we had a debrief session at the end uh, about it. The students really seemed to welcome being open about it, that in some of their classes it's sort of less clear or actually they're not supposed to use it. And so the idea that, oh, we can, we can use this, we can talk about it, we can, uh, we don't have to worry. One of the students asked uh, when I was first introducing the policy and, and looking for their questions, because it was the first time having this version of the policy, so what are your questions on this? One student said, is there a way we could do too much? Like we could go too far. And I have not been able to think of a way they could go too far. 
because you're still responsible for the quality of your work. Whatever you do, you still have to, it, this, I'm using workplace standards and in the workplace, however you get it to the finished product that is the right quality and, but this is also part of the sort of what, what I'm learning about how to teach this is then it brings me to some of my big questions, which if we kind of, I, I think we've, we've sort of put together writing and to a certain extent uh, oral communication as well, that the writing goes with the thinking. And so now we all have a writing assistant. And so does the writing go with the thinking in the same way? Not necessarily. So how do we still get the thinking part in there? And I'm actually really excited about some opportunities. If the students don't have to work as hard at writing, can we actually think about the stuff that is more strategic? So when it comes to communication in a business context, in an institution context, can you persuade people to do the thing you want them to do? It's, and that it depends a lot on your understanding of the audience, what their incentives are, what the larger context is, and so potentially we could actually spend more time on these strategic questions, which is really exciting to do with undergraduates because they'd have a lot less exposure to that than our undergraduates. So excited about those possibilities, and then thinking about the question of automation bias and how to counter for it. The automation bias, the sense that, uh, the, uh, that we tend to believe um, more readily, computer generated, I see you nodding a little bit. And so, okay, how do, we, how do I get around that? How do I help them be really good critics of what they're generating or what somebody else is generating? And you know, that moves us up in Bloom's taxonomy to more of the evaluate level. So also excited about some moving up in the skills there. Awesome, all right, so this is another um, great set of, of comments. And um, let's move um, now to, to Jesse. Hi everyone, so, so I'm, I'm a bit of the, the odd duck on this panel because unlike my colleagues, um, I have not actually used generative AI in the classroom. Uh, so I'm here wearing my hat as director of the NSF funded Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. Uh, we were started in 2020, uh, a, a collaboration between MIT, Harvard, Northeastern and Tufts universities, bringing together people from the theoretical physics community, the experimental physics community, the foundational AI community to try to drive research innovation. Um, and uh, for anyone who has an NSF grant, of course, you know that there are things like broader impacts, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we've used Gen AI in some of our broader impacts activities. Um, but uh, as far as the, the, the classroom goes, I was actually inspired by something that Chris said uh, at a uh, workshop, I guess it was last week, about with Gen AI, Gen AI just, just do something. Okay, maybe you can do something good, but just try to do something. And so this semester I'm teaching a, a basically a kind of a survey course that has some professional development activities for first year physics um, PhD students. And so I took one of the assignments that I was already gonna have the students do, basically uh, develop an elevator pitch about their research, very short, very summary uh, type, and then realize, oh yeah, actually uh, force the students to do Gen AI. And I did it with myself and it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the difference between the kind of original human generated text and the not so well prompt engineered version of a summary that would go on, for example, my webpage. Um, so let me uh, kind of talk first about something just to make a distinction. Um, when we talk about generative AI, oftentimes we're talking about kind of chatbot style uh, tools. Um, but just to say that there's also generative AI or in the context of generative modeling, which is transformative in the scientific context. So I'm a particle physicist, a theoretical particle physicist, so I generate particle collisions in my head and on the blackboard and on a computer. Um, and I use Gen AI tools, but again, in a scientific way, in order to make predictions about what might happen at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, people within our AI Institute generate synthetic universes. Uh, they generate synthetic quantum mechanical field configurations. And so generative AI as a scientific tool is absolutely essential. Uh, and so I was, I was amused what, what Ed was saying about not being able to do math. It's like, yes, deterministic math is very challenging, but what we do in quantum mechanics or statistical physics is all probability. And probability and statistics is absolutely central to the research that we do. And therefore generative AI in that scientific context is, is of course very powerful. And you know, just thinking about how we teach our students, um, I think I saw Peter Damashkin walk through the door, you know, 801, 802, that's a very calculus-based approach to teaching students what physics is. I can imagine some number of years from now we might decide, hey, actually, 
the rise of Gen AI, what are the skill set you need, maybe a probability and statistics focused version of a physics curriculum may be something that we might be moving towards. And within the physics department, uh, my colleague Phil Harris has been developing a course in uh, data science for physics, uh, 816. Uh, and this is a class where it's four modules, of which some of those modules are being slowly uh, uh, turned into MITx uh, uh, modules. It's kind of walking through first kind of shallow machine learning, and then kind of deeper learning, um, and now generative AI, but going through various Nobel Prize winning discoveries and basically reproducing those data analysis um, through, that, through that lens of kind of uh, uh, computational strategies that we would use in the sciences. Okay, so now let's talk about Gen AI in a kind of pseudo classroom uh, setting. Again, I'm talking more about what we've done with our NSF funded institute. Um, one of the things that I wanna make sure that comes across is that uh, these Gen AI tools and the way they behave, these are design decisions made by someone, maybe only implicitly made or sometimes explicitly made. And so when we say, oh, Gen AI behaves in a certain way, well, no, it's that particular version of that particular tool with that particular interface is behaving in that way. And you have an opportunity to change the behavior of those tools, especially if you have technical knowledge about how to tinker with things. And the way that I learned about this was through uh, last year, an April Fool's joke at my expense, you know, <laughs> ChatGPT had just come out, uh, and uh, uh, some of the people within iFi, as a joke, decided to kind of prompt engineer and uh, retrieval augmented uh, uh, generation-ish uh, strategy to make ChatGPT into ChatGessyT. And so if you go to ChatGessyT.com, you can ask it questions and it will respond roughly with the same level of enthusiasm uh, <laughs> of, of, that I'm displaying here. Uh, and uh, you know, some of my, my uh, character flaws, including too many puns, too many acronyms. Um, and it actually is drawing text from my webpage from my 30 most recent papers. It is using information that is you know, more trustable and therefore it actually doesn't really hallucinate or, or rather it hallucinates in a way that is very much in, in keeping with my brand. Um, <laughs> so, this, this retrieval augmented generation, it's a, it's a buzzword that you'll hear more about. This is a way of changing the way you interface with these tools. And what we realized that, is that this is a strategy that we can use for other purposes. So instead of thinking about hallucination as a challenge, you could say, well, actually, there's a certain part of creativity that comes with, with uh, large language models. But if you actually restrict the kind of access to the, the phrasing and, and, and words it can use, you can use it for very interesting purposes. So an example of this is we took chat Jesse D, which was again kind of an April Fool's joke, and just changed the prompt, changed the documents that it was coming from, changed the tone to mimic uh, J. Rop and Robert Oppenheimer. And so you can now go to you know, OpenAI Mer, uh, which is a tool that allows you to kind of interact with a kind of virtual version of Oppenheimer. And we uh, uh, had this at the Cambridge Science Festival. We'd go around to schools with it. And it's really fun to see how uh, uh, kids mostly will interact and the kind of questions that we'll ask and the way that they respond in a kind of a creative way to, uh, to that, that particular tool. Um, so again, it's design decisions that we get to make, and especially if we have technical know-how, we can change the way that things are designed. And let me just give you one final example. Um, you know, in what I just talked about, it's kind of taking various documents and thinking about synthesizing them into a Gen AI tool. Another thing you can think about doing is actually just making the Gen AI tool the product itself. Um, so last year was a year that I did strategic planning in particle physics. Uh, it's the particle physics project prioritization panel, P5. Uh, and it is a whole year long process of deciding the strategic priorities in my field. We're talking about billion dollar a year budgets and trying to get 30 people in a room to all agree. And what do we generate? We generated a document. How long was that document? Too long for anyone to actually read from front to back, including some panel members. So. <laughs> What we did is we did this kind of rag style Gen AI and asked what would happen if you ask questions but conditioned on this particular document, like what would the Gen AI do? And it was shockingly accurate. It really knew what our panel was recommending. And yet we did not release it because then the, the question comes, well, if that's the product, like how much can you stand behind it? Because it's probabilistic, because you don't really know what it's going to say. Again, all the efforts that we did to try to kind of red team it and see whether it was gonna say things that were inappropriate, we couldn't get it to do anything bad, but there's always that worry. And so you know, for people who create content, we need to think about, well, do we ourselves wanna kind of take some ownership over this and actually take our own content and put it in a kind of more chat body type form that may be a way to increase accessibility, or it may open up a can of worms that we may not want to at this point. Thanks.
Cool, awesome. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, our fourth presenter, Takako, uh, tell us about what's happening in your classrooms. Sure. So uh, my name is Takako Aikawa. I'm a senior lecturer in Japanese. Uh, I integrated Gen AI, more specifically Chat GPT, into one of my writing assignments for my third year Japanese. I actually required my students to use Chat GPT for that. Now, the original purpose of this assignment was to enhance my students' uh, vocabulary acquisition. So they were actually previously asked to write short sentences using new vocabulary so that they can actually learn new vocabulary using their own terminology and then context. And then I ran into a big kind of challenge. That is, I had to spend too much time on correcting student errors. So suppose if I spend five or 10 minutes per student correcting errors, if I have 20 students, it took me like 100 minutes already just to correct those errors in this assignment. And furthermore, my students didn't so much kind of at pay attention to my corrections or feedback. What they worried is the final grade, A, B, C, D kind of stuff. So to address these issues, I started wondering what can I do? And then I came up with the idea of maybe ChatGPT can help me. So I redesigned this assignment in the following way last fall. So uh, I asked students to do three tasks, one is like original case, uh, I asked them to write short sentences using new vocabulary. And second, I asked my students to consult with ChatGPT to get alternative sentences. Uh, by the way, ChatGPT's linguistic ability is great. Japanese is also very uh, great. And then the third, and most importantly, I asked uh, my student to compare and analyze the differences between their original sentences and ChatGPT's alternative ones. I thought this type of activity actually enhances not only their linguistic skills, but also their, like, stimulate their metacognitive or analytical thinking, because they have to think in Japanese uh, through these exercises. And um, my students' feedback was actually great. They enjoyed, and then uh, the, one of the best outcomes from this uh, integration is students were exposed to a much larger range of vocabulary and grammar patterns beyond the textbook. So that was a great, actually, benefit that I got. And as I just mentioned, I think students actually really had an opportunity to use their metacognitive use of the target language. They really have to think in Japanese. And third, um, this is my kind of selfish uh, benefit, but it saves my time quite a lot. And, and actually, I got more time to think what kind of activities I should do in class, which I think is the most important thing as a language instructor. Now, I'd like to address two challenges that I encounter through this activity. Uh, one is practical kind of challenge, and the other one is kind of philosophical challenge. So practical challenges, the assessment. What I wanted to do through this uh, exercise or assignment is I wanted to measure what kind of learning or how much learning my students have done through consulting with chat GPT. This is fundamentally different from the traditional, the conventional, like achievement type of quizzes or evaluation. And I'm still struggling uh, how to do it. And Janet Rankin, I think she's sitting there, uh, the director of uh, Teaching and Learning Lab, she suggested to me that Maybe I might want to explore alternative grading system, which actually focuses on the progress students make through the assessment. So I'd like to do some research to see whether I can adapt this grading system for my classes. Now, um, another uh, challenge, which is more philosophical, um, is so what is learning in particular for my case, 
what is the added value? Why people have to learn foreign languages? Gen.AI, LLM, and speech-to-speech -speech technology, you have a perfect AI interpreter. You don't, you don't need to learn foreign languages, yet we, as language teachers, have to kind of be able to answer, why do we have to learn foreign languages? And, and this really is a very kind of deep question for me, and I'd like to be able to kind of keep thinking about this. At the same time, um, I know some uh, language instructors have concern and s skepticism about adopting new technology. Uh, I believe, like Melissa said, I think we need to coexist, and then otherwise we cannot innovate a pedagogy. Uh, so I'd like to keep advocating, uh, you know, the adoption and the integration of Gen AI into language instruction. So that. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So let's have a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. And they, they did something um, astonishing and unprecedented in MIT history. They actually stayed to their time limits. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, so that's going to give us some time to talk a little bit to each other here and then open things up to, to comments from the audience. So get your thinking caps going um, and we'll open it up in a minute. Um, I heard a bunch of things in here. Um, if I put them all together, what I see the four of you doing is building a curriculum um, and in, you know, for teaching w with and about and in a world uh, in which AI is ubiquitous. Um, and I, to me, I think that's really sort of a, you know, a fundamental task of instructors um, at, in higher education and obviously K-12 and workforce as well. Um, and because if we don't build a curriculum, then we, then we build a hidden curriculum that will advantage learners who already know how to use technologies, who've used them before, et cetera, right? and, and you know, sort of building a, a level playing field. Um, so on this note, I would maybe just ask, not, maybe not all of you, but whoever wanted to take this up, um, what, what, you know, what, what do you think that curriculum needs in it that we're not doing right now? Um, you know, what do you wish that the students coming into your classes already knew about generative AI? Either how it works, how to use it, how, you know, how to, how to, how to build on it, et cetera. Right. Any, any thoughts on that? So I, I actually asked the students in, in my Gen AI lecture, I, I had a survey, how, how have you used it previously? So I had um, six options for them. One, did they just play around? Most of them said this. They just played around with it just, just for fun. Did they use it to help, uh, help them study? Like, you know, I'm having trouble with this concept. You know, explain it more, uh, more to, explain it like you would to a high schooler or something like that. Um, did they get advice, like relationships about school, you know, personal things? Do they use it to generate text? like maybe in a different class where they have to write an essay or something. No judgment. I said no judgment. Or do they use it to generate code, like for this class? Again, no judgment. It's anonymous, so I didn't care. Um, the last one was, do you not use it at all? So aside from the ones who said, uh, the, the, the most was they just said they played around with it. That was kind of the highest bar. And otherwise, across the board, everything else was about equal. Um, you know, for the other options. Some students really just didn't use it at all, which was surprising, um, kind of at this stage. I asked why they said they're not sure that they want whatever they type in to just go back into the, the system. I was like, that's, that's fine with me. Um, so I think students coming into the class want to learn how to use Gen AI responsibly for whatever class they're, you know, they're, and Melissa, you know, said they're worried about plagiarism. So they they are they do care. They want it, they want to use it to help them learn better. But they want to use it. Uh, it you know, they want to use it responsibly. Personally, for my class, it since it's, since it's an intro class, it's kind of like giving a kindergartner a cal calculator, right? I can't just let them have free reign to use Gen AI. So my goal for my class is to, I heard this phrase, to have Gen AI be a scaffold, not a crutch. Right to have them, you know, use it to help you understand the topics. Use it to get more practice. Use it to, you know, to get better at this subject. But don't use it to just give you the answer. 
for me, it's it's actually the thinking before you open up ChatGPT or whichever AI you're using, because the the a shortcoming I notice for people often is they don't think creatively enough or, or sort of as thoroughly about the potential tasks, the potential ways that they could interact with it. So the you know okay, I want to write a cover letter like write a cover letter for me. I'm like, wait, a cover letter actually has all these phases. There's the analysis of your fit for the job and what are the primary reasons. There's maybe an outline. There's help me understand the audience. All of these different steps. And that that is the thinking actually that I would like to see everybody get more conscious about before you ask your writing assistant. And so some of you may be familiar with this mental model of thinking of Gen AI as an intern. And the same way that you would have to, okay, I have an intern. What am I going to have this intern do? And you actually have to think about it and then you have to give the intern context and all of that stuff. So it's the, that's the part actually that I see being a, so not a mindful user and then also really being able to use it in more creative or more um, thorough ways and ways that enhance you. So different people have different strengths and weaknesses. And I guess that's the other part, is your understanding of your own strengths and weaknesses. And so selecting where to work with it. So I had a student in the summer say, I find this really frustrating to use. I write very fast. And to try to get the prompting to get to the same level of what I can write is actually kind of a pain. And so for her, it was different. Whereas other people are like, oh my gosh, it gets me off the blank page. This is such, has been such a hurdle for me, and now I just feel better about this. So those are a couple of things I would think about. We, as language instructors, are responsible for human-to-human -human communication. Eventually, we are going to actually interact with AI constantly as well. So we need to be able to communicate well with AI. Uh, that being the case, maybe our responsibility might expand beyond human to human, but also human to AI. That's one thing. Now, another thing I've been thinking about is people often talk about AI can really provide personalized kind of tutor, uh, assistant. But I really yet, I don't know how, how I can really utilize this personalized part into our language curriculum. That, that's what I'm still struggling with. Uh, let me ask one more question, and then um, feel free in the meantime to if, uh, gather yours and start making your way to the, to the microphones. I want to um, come to the panel about this question of, of thinking. Um, so Melissa, you brought this up. Takako, you gave us this important word, metacognition, right? the way that students think about what they're learning and how they're learning it. Um, and so maybe, you know, just again, let's just drill down on that a little bit more, double click on it, or whatever the metaphor is, right? Um, uh, you know, what does it mean um, to think, you know, in, in this new, new era? So when uh, our AI Institute launched, uh, I talked to someone from the New York Times, who, you know, asked the very provocative question, you know, will, will AI ever come up with a theory of everything? Um, you know, so as, some of the, as, as, as a theoretical physicist, I'd like to think that the things that I'm doing, you know, require intense creativity and, you know, really require uh, something that's very human to understand how the universe works. Um, and I think a lot of times when we're talking about something like Gen AI, we're, we're asking how can we make the machine, you know, behave or act, uh, you know, more like a human. And I've basically changed my mind in kind of reverse that I feel like part of it in, in this build of what you're saying is how does the human think a little bit more like a computer? Um, that it's actually quite difficult to, to imagine, wait a second, I have this tool that if I keep entering the same text over and over and over again, I'm gonna get this huge statistical distribution of possibilities. And getting your brain to encounter that and, and engage with that and, and view that not as a threat but as a resource uh, is something that I would like to, you know, in some sense, train my own brain to think about. And so when, I, when someone asks me, oh, well, there's no way, or someone says, no way that, that, the, that a computer could ever come up with a theory of everything. I was like, well, actually, have you ever thought algorithmically what it means to come up with a theory of everything? Have you ever thought algorithmically what it means to be creative? Have you ever thought algorithmically what it means to have an epiphany? Um, and when you start saying those words, 
it starts off in the kind of the, in the crackpot land, right? And then it starts transitioning to, oh wait, let me see if I can turn these into equations. And this is the equation, this is what it would correspond to. Um, and then you start running into really fascinating things about you know, computational resources, computational complexity. And you start to then, I think, have a, a better appreciation for knowledge and thinking more broadly when you think about the way that cognition in quotes is done by a, by a computer, how it's quite different than the way at least we conceptualize our cognition, but may actually give us uh, you know, a, a new way of, of uh, interacting, in my case, with scientific data sets, but also in other cases you know, with, with learning more generally. Anybody else want to jump in on that or just briefly? I don't have a full answer, but I am thinking like you're doing that spending more of the in-class time on the kind of thinking part and mm -hmm. working in small groups or, you know, solo and then talking about it and that when we have these cognitive shortcuts available that we need some discipline or space where we aren't using those cognitive shortcuts. And I'm, I have been getting flashbacks to a very long time ago when I was very serious competing in math in high school. And that was a space in our math competitions you did not use a calculator. And the way that my brain developed because of that was a little different, I think, than, than my classmates who weren't doing this kind of math competition. And so what is, you know, is that valuable when it comes to thinking within the field of communication? And if so, we have to create that space that pushes us to do it because otherwise, because we think there's a value in it. Um, so that's some of the, the questions I'm mm -hmm. thinking about regarding thinking. <laughs> Excellent, all right, thank you. So we've got some great brain power in the room and let's, let's open up, start us off. Hey, I'm Karen Sollins. I'm a security researcher here in CSAO. Um, so I'm by nature skeptical. <laughs> um, recently ran across a paper that was published in late November from Stanford on a study of having student, well, mostly students, um, writing pieces of code, a particular set of them um, that were designed to, to explore some security problems. There were two parts to the study, and I think this is the reason I bring this up. The first was, could they write code? Some of them were allowed to use an AI assistant, some of them were not, so they had a comparison. The second was a set of questions that they gave to the, to the participants, which was, how much do you trust the actual code that you've written? And the interesting thing, two par interesting parts of it. First of all, the code that was generated was less secure by any metric they could come up with. The other was that the people who actually used the AI assistants trusted that much more than those who did not. And that question of trust, I think, is, the, is a key hard problem in this space. How do we teach the students not to trust what they get, in some sense? How do we teach them that skepticism? Because that's got to be part of it. Those language translators are never going to be perfect. They're just not, I'm sorry. You know? So how do we get people to understand how to think through that problem of where to place trust, how much trust to place, where, are they be, where should they be skeptical? I think you're, you're all kind of hinting at that, but I think we need to make that really explicit. That's a great question. So as, a, as someone who teaches the intro programming, I feel like that's my job. <laughs> um, we have to start right at the beginning, right? That's why as someone who does teach intro programming, I don't want to say don't use Gen AI, right? You know, save it for later. I think it's important to teach them as soon as they have an opportunity to use it, to use it the right way. So that's why I think my focus would be on what is the kind of, you know, if you have a, if you have a problem you do want to use Gen AI for, set up the context, give as much details as possible, you know, to set up the problem so that the Gen AI can write it as best it can. But then even after it gives you a response back, you have to be critical about that response. You can't just trust and, and I've, you know, I've shown them really basic examples, things that they have written themselves in five minutes or less, right? And with the prompt engineering, it took us way more than five minutes to get the Gen AI to come up with an answer that was uh, as good as what they came up with their own, you know, their own brains. So I think those examples alone could be enough to get the students to think, huh, maybe this isn't, you know, as good as I, as, you know, as I thought it was it's really important to think about the answer it, get, it gives back to us. Um. 
So I, I can say, uh, so the word trustworthy, by the way, is in the, uh, the Biden administration's executive order on AI. It's like safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. Um, let me come back to what I said before about being design decisions. Um, it is absolutely crazy to me as a scientist <laughs> that I use a tool that's a probabilistic tool and I get an answer with no uncertainty band. And of course, it's very difficult to, to explain to people what uncertainties are. Um, uh, but that, in some sense, needs to be part of the design uh, of, of these tools to give some kind of information. Um, because trustworthiness in terms of just the output, there is no possibility of having anything being trustworthy if all I get is just an answer. If I don't have unit checks, if I don't have uncertainty bands, if I don't have something else. And so the idea that, that you can somehow make AI more trustworthy is I know the interface and the output needs to be of a form that there is at least pieces that you can verify or things that you can cross-check, uh, check some, something like that. Um, and so I think it's, it, it, it's, a, a, it's a design flaw in the current way that we have our interface that we're even asking a question which is somehow the wrong one. It should be more about how do you change the tools such that we have the diagnostic capabilities that we're more familiar with with other tools that we've used. Mm -hmm. Great point. In response to that language, uh, trans I mean, you mentioned translation. Uh, LLM is quite good. It's a predicting the, the correct word. So uh, they don't uh, make bad uh, sentences anyway to begin with. Um, I, of, of course, you know, uh, told my students uh, this hallucination program, there are some errors. And if, if by any chance LLM makes mistakes, and then if my students actually catch it, I would be very happy, actually, for that as well. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, my name is Peer Urlaub. I'm director of Global Languages, so I'm one of the humanities people here in the room. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. This is less a, this is less a question and more an observation. Um, but I think it, it's very, very, very interesting in the, in the, in the, in the last part of your discussion uh, when we started to touch the question, what is learning or what, what kind of learning or why does learning happen in these contexts and perhaps sometimes also why not? And I think that all four of you presented uh, projects and ideas that foot perfectly in established theories of learning. And I think this is important for us to consider that because that helps us to develop templates that help also colleagues who are not as innovative and creative as the four colleagues who are sitting on the stage today um, to understand what's going on and to learn how to build AI productively, responsibly, and ethically in their class. And the, and the theory I'm talking about is social culture learning. There's this model of the um, zone of op uh, approximate development um, some of you not uh, there, your heads, you've heard about it. It's based on actually uh, Vygotsky, who was a child psychologist in Russia uh, about 100 years ago, which sounds really, really, really odd to evoke theories like that at a place like MIT. But it's very, very, very useful and has been rediscovered in history several times. So the zone of proximate development is what the learner can do only assisted by somebody. Yeah? If you ask students to do something that they can do anyway, they will, they will not learn. If they ask students something that they can't do at all, uh, they won't learn at all. But it's like the child that, assisted by the parents, learns how to walk. And I think what you four presented fits perfectly into this model, because you find ways to deploy AI in the way that AI becomes, so to say, the parent of the child learning to walk. Yeah. yeah, that you guide your students through this very, 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 sometimes very thin layer of where they can do things, but still only assisted through AI. Yeah. So that's kind of an observation. And thank you so much. This is a great event. This was a great discussion. And um, I shut that up. No, thank you. <laughs> Zone of proximate development. Anyone want to reflect on that? Um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think it raises this very important question of, um, I, I'll pick up on one thing that, that Per said, which is, um, he is right, we picked four good instructors and four thoughtful <laughs> instructors, um, and also four um, who are not what, you know, in that session last week I called ostriches. You know, are, we have ostrich <laughs> colleagues out there, right, with their heads in the sand, who think, oh, my students would never use AI, or my students, my assessments are, you know, so great, that, uh, et cetera. 
Um, and those are the ones that we actually need to be doing in our own departments and, and you know, our own sort of communities, doing, having that kind of conversation with, right? Um, and, and, you know, sort of just showing, and I think they learn more by examples, my, more by what's happening here in year two, where, the, oh, my colleague did this thing in a class I used to teach, than maybe some of the, you know, kind of big uh, keynote -y kind of hype cycle stuff from the first, first year of, of commercial generative AI. Next question. Uh, hi, I'm a, another humanities person, researcher and instructor at the MIT Game Lab. Um, and I have a class where there's no right answers. It's a creative class. We're creating new um, software, new games. Um, and we're trying to figure out how Gen.I is gonna be involved in that. So we have, like, we don't have to worry about plagiarism so much. I'm not worried about um, those kinds of ethical decisions. We're tr what I'm wondering about for, is what are you and your students thinking about the training data uh, that's used in these AI, in gen, gen AI models, um, the creators of the schools, and where are they coming from, and what their purposes are, and what their intentions are, but also just, but also where are the sources uh, for this data? Um, who, who originally created these words? Who originally created these pixels? Uh, these things that we're that we're getting out of, uh, out of these models. Um, I don't think a lot of people have answers yet, but I'm just curious what you and your students are thinking about that. And are you are you having these conversations, and what kind of conversations you're having? Mm -hmm. Great question. So the, the, the word, this is not quite getting at what we're uh, touching on. Uh, part of this is about like making sure people get credit for their creative work. Um, in the scientific context, you're really talking about provenance, like where is information coming from? Um, and when you have to, you know, you have some sentence and you have to know whether to trust or not, figuring out, well, can you trace back where it came from? And partly why I, I keep mentioning this retrieval augmented generation is that those are a design that allows you to actually do citation to like particular blocks of text. But yeah, the, the issue of, of copyright, of, of, of creativity, of attribution, uh, this is a huge one. Um, and I wish I had a good answer to it. And it, it was basically in the way that these models are trained. It doesn't keep the information about where the information originally came from. Now you can imagine increasing your computational resources so that you could really start to track where these pixels were coming from. Um, and so there are people who are trying to think in, in that direction, um, but it's very, very challenging. And so just as an example of, of this, um, there are some claims that you can take a, a, a Gen AI model already trained and someone says, hey, you use my copyrighted work. And then you can anti um, uh, gradient descent to try to unlearn that bit of information. But then there's this arms race of people saying, well, actually, no, secretly, it's still remembering it. And that even though it's start, supposed to be unlearned, you can kind of like kind of get it back in some way. And so this also kind of touches on the security thing of saying, when I'm typing something into one of these tools, it's my own text being used as part of the training. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, this, this Biden administration, safe, secure, and trustworthy, that secure part and understanding, you know, where that information is coming from is a huge issue. Um, maybe there are computational strategies for it, but I think there needs to be a bigger discussion. So uh, I did that homework, by the way, together. I also asked ChatGPT, you know, that question, and I agree that ChatGPT gave really great answers. Uh, however, what I, what I thought would be kind of a little bit answer or intuitive uh, kind of response to that question is, Suppose if I'm communicating with Jess, you know, just using the earbuds and then the AI can communicate. You know, she, he doesn't know any Japanese, and, uh, but I can communicate with him using Japanese. Uh, but I, he probably doesn't know what really is really, what word are really being used, what nuance is going on. He doesn't have any control over his communication. And I don't think we can really build up interpersonal, I don't like using this word, but interpersonal kind of connection using that AI interpreter kind of communication. And, but uh, I think we language instructors at least need to be able to respond if someone asks to us, you know. Yeah. No, in some ways it's like the same reason we, you leave the sound on when you're watching a movie with subtitles, right? Uh, because exactly. there's something in the sound that's not going to be there in the subtitles, right? right? Um, what about in some of these other fields, you know, writing essays or, or uh, introductory code where, where some people are saying, well, 
maybe we don't need to do it anymore. So the word I caught was authenticity. And I have been thinking about this, not just in my course, but in general. Are, are we going to place a higher value on things that we think are authentic? So if you get an apology letter from someone, or if somebody gives a presentation, if you know that how it was generated, if you know that it is really theirs and what does theirs mean um, uh, versus it being generated predominantly by AI, you know, how do we feel about that? And do we start to place more time and attention on the things that are more authentic? Uh, and so then how does that influence, again, what we write and we present in business settings and school settings? Uh, that is, again, I don't have an answer, but I think that is an evolving thing that we're going to see because the, the price of generating content has just gone way down. So that means we could see a lot more content around and how are we going to react to that and then how do we tell if something's authentic? These are questions I have. Um, well, for generating code, I think it's only gonna get better. Uh, Jenny, I is just going to get better and better at doing that. So I think the role of a programmer, um, software engineer becomes sort of on the ends of the generating code part. So the generating code part can just be done by the Gen AI and it will do it in really good style, great variable names, nice comments so we understand. But then the role of the programmer becomes sort of on the endpoint. So it's putting the thing that you want to create into context, right? Having a really clear design document for what you want the Gen AI to create for you, right, becomes more important. Having a plan becomes really important. You can't just say, write a fun video game for me in Python. Mm. No, you have to be very clear about what you want the game to do, what the characters, you know, all those details become now even more important. So like the, the design document becomes very important. And then after the code is generated, yes, in the future it'll probably be correct, but the part where you do the testing now also becomes more important. Uh, so the role of the programmer is now, you know, take, the programmer now takes on the role of maybe more of a tester, so creating unit tests, making sure that the code that's generated is actually correct now becomes more important. So let me put these together. Is there, uh, is there an authenticity issue in code? <laughs> I personally love reading code ge generated by Gen AI, more so than my colleagues' codes don't tell them. That. Oh. Why is that? It's well documented. There's you know, comments on every line. I understand what it's doing. I can just say, what does this variable do? And then it just tells me. It's, it's yeah. All right, fantastic. So, authenticity, is, it's just more of a pleasure reading that. <laughs> Good. All right, so um, I think maybe um, we'll hear these two questions and, and then we'll go from there. So. Yeah, um, so, so since I teach intro programming, I think the, the problems that students would get as practice are pretty easy for the Gen AI to generate, right? So it'd be something like, you know, give me a practice problem with loops, right? So it'll just give you something simple like, print all the, you know, write Python code to print all the numbers from one to 12. Or write a loop to print, you know, to print all the numbers, or all the even numbers between one and 12. All right, so those are the kinds of examples that I think students want. And at the level, you know, since they're just learning about programming, they can't kind of come up with that prompt themselves and then test themselves on it. So they just need someone, me or a Gen AI, to just tell them this, you know, simple, text, very simple um, English text to just get them, get them going on, on, on this idea. Certainly at higher levels, right, you could say something like, uh, you know, uh, you know write, uh, the, the prompt could be, you know, write a recursive code to find all the paths between Boston and New York City, right? That, that would be a, a harder prompt um, for students to come up with as a problem with recursion, that's one of the topics in computer science. But you know, the Gen AI could just say that, and then the student can you know write some code related to that, and maybe it could it could test it out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just add something about you know, in in cases where you really want to have guarantees, provable guarantees, 
Now, there are computer languages that are used for mathematical proofs. And you can have the large language model output code in those programming languages, make sure that it compiles. And that is, in fact, one of the ways that researchers are trying to solve the math problem, is actually you convert it into some code behind the scenes and then solve it that way. And then you have the same guarantees that we have for other computer-aided uh, uh, proof making. So there, there are that kind of strategy. Uh, they can't work in all cases, but that's something to also to think about, is that if we're really worried about like guarantees, OK, then let's use the tools that we already have that have certain guarantees built in. Thank you. I suspect it is not one answer that, so I can see some students are thinking more about their thinking, and that came up in our debrief. Somebody said, I like how it makes me think more about what I want, because it, you know, it, he, the student must have gotten some sort of draft, and in, in critically thinking about what was in front of the student, they realized, oh, wait, how, how do I know it's what I want or what I not? So some are thinking about that, and others are not. Yeah, others are, um, <laughs> it's like, OK, I know you're using this tool. Um, do you have to be so obvious about it? <laughs> and, and just, yeah. Um, so I'm very curious about that also. And I think it is going to be a range. And one of the things I would want to do, I think, like all of us, can we can we get more of the metacognition? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a brilliant um, setup for uh, the session that will be coming next um, on generative AI in school and work, which will feature uh, participation from MIT students and alumni. Um, so we'll get to hear directly from them. Um, but let me, let's take a second first just to thank our panelists again for really fantastic. <laughs>